Howdy y'all. Welcome back to our course, Databases Demystified, sponsored by Fivetran. I'm your host, Michael Kaminsky. Today, we are going to talk about two major paradigms in databases, analytical and transactional. It's important to understand these paradigms for working with databases in order to understand the trade-offs one might make when choosing different database technologies. In this lesson, we'll cover both different use cases, as well as some frequently used technologies for both of these paradigms. When thinking about analytical and transactional databases, I like to think about the two different types of people who use these databases. You, yourself, depending on your background, you might be more familiar with one of these two paradigms than the other. To start, data scientists and analysts spend most of their time working with data, but in a very different way than software engineers do. They work analytically. They tend to be executing queries against the database, analyzing the data offline. They care a lot about how the data is stored and how to access it efficiently. But that's a very different use case than what software engineers are thinking about. Software engineers are thinking about app stability, app maintainability, questions about throughput, how fast the app responds to certain queries. And it's really these two different types of users that are going to inform how we think about these different to start, we're going to talk about analytical workloads and how data analysts and data scientists tend to work with databases. The first thing to keep in mind is that in this paradigm, analysts and data scientists are interested in processing large amounts of information in order to create aggregates. They might be interested in knowing about the average order value yesterday in California or something like that. That's going to require looking over a whole lot of rows in the database in order to calculate that aggregate. Additionally, almost all of these queries are read only. Answering a question like that is really about getting data out of the database, not putting data into or modifying existing data. Occasionally, we may talk about doing a batch write data load where you have to load a lot of data from one system into the database or data warehouse. But really, the defining characteristic of analytical workloads is doing an analysis on a whole lot of data all at once, rather than doing cell by cell manipulation. In the analytical world, we need to be able to support complex queries with lots of different data processing steps. You might imagine a query hundreds of lines long that has lots of complex joins and filters and other data transformations. All of those things are very common in an analytical workload. Finally, the thing to keep in mind is that these analytical workloads can be highly variable. So it's not often that we're running the same query over and over and over again. You might have an analyst coming into work one day, writing a very complex query to answer one very specific question. They answer it, and the next day they come in with a very different question and a very different, very complex query to write. In a transactional workload, we're generally most concerned with managing the state of one object at a time. When I say object, what I mean is something like a user or an order or even a patient in a hospital system. So if you're a software engineer and you're working on a web app, that's an e-commerce app that allows customers to purchase goods, or it's a hospital app that helps track the status of different patients. What we're talking about in this sort of paradigm is managing one object at a time. We're looking at one user, one order, one patient. And we're not necessarily trying to perform aggregates over all of the data that we have all at once. In a transactional workload, what's important is being able to manipulate the state of those different objects. Software engineers often refer to these as CRUD operations for create, read, update, and delete. So you might create a user's order. You might read a user's order history. You might update the state of an order from shipped to delivered. You might delete some of those records. That's really what we're talking about in transactional workloads, managing all of those different units, reading these objects one at a time, updating the data one cell at a time, those types of operations, and not necessarily doing big aggregates across all of the data. We're going to cover this in more detail in a future lesson when we talk about transactions, but it's important to know that there's a layer of complexity here that's about precisely managing the state of the database and what has been written to disk and will be saved and what hasn't. We'll get into the details of why that's important in the future, but that's a really important component of this transactional style of working. Finally, transactional databases need to be able to support a lot of throughput. Your website needs to be able to support hundreds or even thousands of concurrent users, hundreds of people checking out and trying to pay all at one time. And all of these activities need to be able to happen at once with all of the different connections that they apply, and we don't generally see that in analytical work. 
So to summarize, in the analytical world, we're talking about calculating complex aggregates, whereas in the transactional world, we're really only operating on one object at a time. In the analytical world, we're mostly doing read-only queries with occasional batch write jobs. On the transactional world, the whole game is about doing those CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete, very efficiently. In the analytical world, we need to support really complex queries. Whereas in the transactional world, we want to manage the state of the database very precisely with sophisticated guarantees about exactly what has or hasn't been saved. Finally, in the analytical world, we're supporting ad hoc and relatively infrequent analyses. Whereas in the transactional world, we need to support many operations per second with very high throughput. Here are a few technologies that you might be familiar with or that you might have heard of that fit into these different paradigms. This might help you think about where you've encountered analytical and transactional workloads in the past. On the analytical side, we have data warehousing tools like Redshift, BigQuery, and Snowflake, as well as the MapReduce family of tools like Hive, HDFS, and Spark. On the transactional side, some very common tools are PostgreSQL and MySQL. They're both open source. And on the proprietary side, we have Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle Database. These aren't all of the databases within these paradigms, but they are an important few to know about. And if you've worked with them in the past, it might help you to understand why they work the way that they do and what they're optimized for. That's all that we have for today. Hopefully you've learned something in this lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to pop open the hood and really look at how these different types of databases function, how they're architected, why they work the way that they do, and what that implies about the trade-offs between the different types of databases. We'll see you there soon, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you've learned something today.